presence of God himself. Let's take this journey through uh, this Psalm of David and see where the Word of God takes us as we do so. First of all, what is the goal of our journey? So that's really where we start, the goal of our journey. Brother Lawrence, in his book, Practicing the Presence of God, says that we should establish ourselves in a sense of God's presence by continually conversing with him. That it was a shameful thing to quit his conversation to think of trifles and fooleries. Now, that's kind of hard to understand. Brother Lawrence was writing a long, long time ago. But let me read that again. That we should establish ourselves in a sense of God's presence by continually conversing with him. Stop. We need to stop right there. What does it mean to be continually in the presence of God? One of the benefits that I have in being married is that I'm continually in relationship with my wife. We're always having some sort of conversation. There's always some sort of topic for the day or the moment. There's always some sort of meaningful interaction that takes place. That doesn't mean that every moment of every day I'm talking to my wife who's an introvert. She would probably tape my mouth shut. However, I am in constant communication with her. And that's different than always talking. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's different than always talking. Sometimes talking does not equate communication. It just equates noise. It's important that in our relationship, and Brother Lawrence is saying that here, in our relationship that we continually are conversing with him. Then he says it was a shameful thing to quit this conversation. If I quit communicating with my wife, I just quit talking with her, what do you think would happen to our marriage? It, it would start parting ways. We would start going astray from each other. So he says it was a shameful thing to quit his conversation to think of trifles and fooleries. That's old language, but I still think you can figure out what trifles and fooleries might be. Silly things. Things that don't really matter. We get focused on that. Oh boy, does that start sounding familiar. Have you ever gotten so focused on the garbage that's around you that you've lost track of the big picture? Oh boy, there we go. Ding, 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 ding. That sounds very modern. In the midst of the muck, we have lost our focus for the journey. So in the presence of God, we can see clearly who God is. The other day on Facebook, it had been an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous evening. And there was no less than probably a dozen pictures of the sunset that people had taken. And one of the captions there was something like this. It's hard to beat God's artistic paintings. When you saw the purples and the oranges and the pinks and the dark browns of that beautiful sunset that was taking place, there's something that isn't there that happens inside of us that just makes us stop and take notice of that. You know, when we do things like that, you may think this is silly, but when we do things like that, we are reconnecting with our Creator. We are doing what we're asked to do is to be still and know that He is God. When you stand on the shore of Lake Huron 
and there's not a bunch of people around, and there's not a bunch of boats, and you look out over there, and as far as you can see is this blue expanse that seems to somehow merge into the gorgeous sky. Have you stood on the lakeshore and watched the sunrise? Be still and know that I am God. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But just as he who has called you is holy, be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. And I want to take a little time here because I think that we forget about this. The importance of being like our Creator. He is calling us to holiness. A holy life. What does that mean? Does that mean my jeans are wore out and I have holes in them? That's not what I'm talking about. Holiness means I'm living less like the world and I'm living more like Jesus. If I can boil it down to the simplest nature, I'm living less like the world around. My life has a lot less junk and it looks a lot more like Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean I'm, you know, snooty and I'm not going to do anything with you because you're a little different and you don't do things quite right. That's not what I'm talking about. What did Jesus do? <laughs> he got accused of being a friend of the sinners because he would go to their house, he would eat with them, he loved them, but he called them to walk like him. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Come walk with me. Folks, it's not about religion. It's not about sitting in these padded chairs. It's not about attending a church service. Though those things help, and thank God for the padded chairs, I don't want to go back to hard pews. There's some comforts that we enjoy, but he said, come follow me. That means come follow me in reaching out to others. Come follow me in doing the things that I do. Come follow me in being like I am. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father? Now, kind of a weird idea that I have is like there's this heavenly beam that is like beaming down. There's like a beam from God to God the Father to God the Son. Now, this is not real. You won't find this in a theology book anywhere. However, if I'm looking at an exact representation, since I don't see God directly, because God is so pure and holy, I cannot be in his presence because of all my sin, but I see an exact representation as Jesus came to this earth. Now, stick with me. Don't start throwing tomatoes yet. As Jesus came to this earth and walked on this sod, people saw who he was. He represented everything, absolutely everything that God had given to the people through his word. He was an exact representation. Now, when Jesus ended up being crucified, he was without sin. He didn't do anything to deserve to die. But what happened, the Bible says, is he became our sacrifice. Why is that? Well, Romans 3, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Greater love has no man than this, then he lay down his life for his friend. What Jesus did is he said, look, I love these folks. I love you so much. 
that I'm going to give my life as a sacrifice one time for all of your sins, past, present, and future. When he did that, he made a way and access to God the Father that we did not have. On this earth, when, when Jesus died, when he breathed his last breath and he called out, it is finished. The Bible records that the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. And it wasn't some little curtain. It was thick. Thick. When that curtain tore in two, it exposed the Holy of Holies where a priest was only allowed to go one time a year. And if he wasn't right before the Lord, the Lord would strike him dead. But that temple veil was torn in two and exposed the Holy of Holies. The Bible says that now we have access to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. He is our advocate. So when the devil starts going, hey, you know what so-and-so did? Don't you remember what they did back then? <laughs> if we have made our life right with the Lord, if we have asked him to forgive us of our sins, to come in and take our, live in us, live in our hearts. The Lord steps forward, Jesus steps forward, says, but I, I paid. I paid for that. That debt's already been paid for. You see, the Bible also says that the accuser of, our breth of the brethren, of the brothers and the sisters, is there standing before God, accusing us day and night, But if our sins have been forgiven, our advocate, what's an ad advocate? Another name for an advocate is a lawyer. Our advocate, our lawyer, steps up and said, you know what? His price, the price that needs to be paid for his sins have been paid. He's free to go. He's free to go. And I can only imagine as Jesus walks you out of that, that courtroom, go and sin no more. And then the, unfortunately, sometimes we're back in there and he brings us back in and 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins to for, for, excuse me, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come back through the door and Jesus doesn't go, oh, not again. It's the seventh time this week. I'm about out of my patience with them. Maybe you won't see me. No. We come back through that door again and Jesus why are you here? He already knows. Well, Lord, I know you told me to go and sin no more, but I blew it again. And this is what I did. Oh, Rick, I love you so much. I paid the price for that. And you've confessed your sin. Let's go take care of that. Oh, look, there he comes. You know what he did, Jesus? Yeah, we've already talked. Price has been paid. Nail marks. The blood that ran down the cross paid for his sin. Hey, so Rick, how you been doing? Yeah, okay, great. Well, I'll tell you what, go and sin no more. 
Folks, we do not mean to be afraid of talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need to be afraid of confessing our sins. There's been this kind of this aura that if we confess our sins, we throw stones at each other. Can you imagine a soldier on the, the battlefield down with a bullet in his side? Hurting, bleeding. Oh. And the rest of his company comes up. You dumbo, what are you doing? You told you not to stick your nose out there. No. They help him up. Oh, wow. Oh, they get him to the medic. They get help to him. We're the church. Oh. When sin gets us when we mess up it's like a bullet from the enemy church we gather around and we help each other i don't want to lose one of you we help each other that's come on let me let me talk with you let's let's work through this do you remember that 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, where are you at? Have you talked with the Lord? Love a person through that. Walk them through that. Look, the goal is holiness. What is holiness? Being like him. Being like the one that paid the price for all of us. Being like the one that says that the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. He's calling us to walk with him and to be like him in the presence of god we find strength and we find answers to our prayers psalm 66 verses 17 through 20 says i cried out to him with my mouth his praise was on my tongue if i had cherished sin in my heart the lord would have listened but god has surely listened and heard my prayer praise be to god who has catch this listen Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. He wants to hear from you. James 4, 8 through 8, and, excuse me, James chapter 4, verses 8 and verse 10 says, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So seeking God's presence or his face. We want to look at four things here. Seeking God's presence, that is his face. Uh, you hear people say, I want to seek God's face. That sounds a little weird, uh, strange. Is there a picture of God someplace that I need to go find? You know, is there a light that I can turn on to see God's face? It is a way of saying, I want to be close to God. I want to be in his presence. I want to know, if I want to go seek the face of my wife, I want to be in her presence. If I'm seeking her face, there's probably going to be kissing involved. I know all of you are going, you didn't have to tell me that. It's okay. I just want to make sure you're all awake yet, right? Okay, there we go. Let's move on. Don't think about it. Number one, we need to have a convicting view of our sin. We need to have a convicting view of our sin. E.M. Bounds, one of my favorite authors of all time, very, did, wasn't known well at all until after he died, and they put his writings together. Phenomenal story. Look him up on the internet. E.M. Bounds, many Christians have a feeble view of sin because they have no clear vision of the Holy One. If we're going to live like Jesus... We need to know what Jesus is like. And the way you find out about how, what Jesus is, is you read his word. It's all there. You begin to look at it. Love your neighbor as yourself, but God, my neighbor is an idiot. We don't use those words in church, please. Oh. But God, my neighbor is not very nice. Well, what are we supposed to do? love your neighbor as yourself? Do I have to? 
Have we all been there? Lord, you're going to have to help me on this one. Yeah, we've all been there. Why? Because we're human. And that's not like us to do that stuff automatically. Hmm. Number two, we need to submit to God and resist the devil. Oh, so if my neighbor's challenging, how does this have anything to do with submitting to God and resisting the devil? Because I guarantee you the devil's in your ear. You know what you can do to them to get back? This would be really fun. Oh, we've all done it. We've all thought about doing something silly that we probably wouldn't really do. But I've seen neighbors get crazy on each other. So what do we do? Resist the devil and we submit to God. Submit, verse James chapter 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When we submit to God, we are resisting the devil. We're either submitting to God in his ways or to the evil ways of this world and the prince of this world. Think about that. We're either submitting to God in the right way or we're submitting to the evil one in the evil way. There's really no in between. Sometimes the best thing you can do with someone who's really on your nerves is to zip your mouth Take that little key right here. You guys still awake? And then you throw it away. And you don't say anything because your mouth gets you into lots of trouble. How many of you would admit publicly, my mouth has gotten me in trouble? <laughs> Look around. Come on, you're not the only one. You're all raising your hands. And the ones of you that aren't raising your hands, your tongue bleeds. Our tongue, our mouth, gets us into more trouble than anything else. How many of you have ever said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I probably, I, I wish I could take that back. You don't have to raise your hands. What we need, folks, is innocent hands and pure motives. Boy, that's pretty sparse in our world today. I got an assignment for you tonight, this afternoon for those of you that are on Facebook. I want you to scroll through there and think about innocent, pan, innocent hands and pure motives. Really. Look through our newscasts. Innocent hands, pure motives. Whoa. Yeah, Ashley's right about that much. It's just not out there. We find that God will not tolerate sin in his presence. So if we think we can have our cake and eat it too, we can't do that. If you want to experience God's presence, then you need to allow God to begin to work in your life and you need to work in your life to begin to eradicate that sin, the practice of sin in your life. He wants pure hands, which represents our actions. We do things with our hands and a pure heart. What's on the inside? Did you know what you think? If it's wrong is a sin too. Not just what you do. Because what comes first? The chicken or the egg? The thought or the action? Yeah, exactly. Scripture says, out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. Number four, we need to put God first. The one who lifts up his soul, this is from um, the original psalm there, from ch chapter 24. Halfway through first, verse four, the one who lifts up his soul to an idol or swears by what is false is the double-minded man in James. You cannot say 
that I am a follower of Christ and I love the Lord Jesus and yet live like hell the rest of the week. That, that is something that some faiths, unfortunately, have promoted. And you see that a lot, where during the week, you cannot tell that that person even goes to church. And then on Sunday, they show up, and they sit in their pew, they say the right things, sing the right things, know the right things to do, and they clean up pretty good. But Monday through Saturday, it's a different story. He expects us to enter into God's presence because he sees nothing wrong with where he's at or what he's doing. That's the double-minded man. All right, finally, entering God's presence. When we enter into God's presence, we begin to receive a clear blessings from him. Look, you're not going to get it all right. You're not going to be perfect. <laughs> you're going to blow it. Your mouth's going to run when it should be shut. You're going to do something you shouldn't do. You're going to say something you shouldn't say. It's going to happen. But there's blessings and vindication. When we've sought to be right with the Lord, coming back, asking for forgiveness, allowing God's, uh, allowing Jesus' forgiveness to be applied to our sin, when we've sought to be right with God in our actions, and in our motives, our hands and our heart, we will bless, he will bless us and vindicate us, which means he will approve us to enter into his presence. If you wonder why you're struggling in your life, but you have so much stuff that is not from God in your life, then you need to start working on the junk pile over here. That needs to go. Psalm 66, 18 says, and this, this made me when I was reading this this morning, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, a clear sense of unworthiness. In that section in Isaiah, Isaiah sees the Lord, and the first thing he sees when he sees the Lord seated on the throne, he says, I am a man of unclean lips. He says, woe to me. I'm ruined. If we were to see God exalted, sitting on his throne, we'd be devastated. Isaiah says, woe to me. I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the, glory, the Lord Almighty. I know this is getting a little bit long. I want you to understand that God is calling us to a life that we live right. He clearly understands that our lives won't be perfect. If they were perfect, there would be no need for forgiveness of sins. E.M. Bounds once again says, Nearness to God intensifies and expands our view of sin. So if I want to get a clear view of God, let me give you this idea. If I were to go back and shut off all the lights and I held up a little lantern up here, and if you're back there in the back row, you wouldn't be able to tell exactly what I'm doing up here. You, you'd know there's light up here, but you wouldn't be able to tell. The closer you get to the lantern, you'd begin to be able to tell what this is. If you got right up here, you might be able to say, oh, that's a Coleman lantern. You could tell the closer that you got to the light, the closer that we get to the Lord in his presence, we begin to understand more about who God is. Things become clearer. We know him. We begin to trust him more and more. James 4, 9 says, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. My final question here for you, what would happen in your life if you were to begin to intently seek God? 
What would happen in your life if you were to intently begin to seek God? So I'm going to challenge you. Start the pilgrimage. Find a time. Sit around a fire someplace. Find a spot where it's quiet in the house and begin to seek God. Seek after Him. If you need to do some business and say, you know what, Lord, it's been a while. I'm kind of off track. It's okay. Remember, He's not there to throw stones. Oh, come on in. Sit down. Tell me what's going on. The Lord already knows, but He wants to hear it from you. Remember when you were, had kids, you already knew what they did, but you really wanted to hear it from them. It makes a big difference. He loves you. He loves you very, very much. For while we were yet sinners, in full rebellion, Christ died for us. I'm going to ask our worship team to come and as they come, I'm going to issue a little bit more of a challenge here. And Alex, if you just want to start playing, that'd be great. I want to issue a little bit more of a challenge. <laughs> Don't just take this as some light challenge. What if today, what if today you could say, this is the date, the 28th of July, 2020, in the midst of the craziest year we've lived in a long time, July 28, 2020, was the start of my journey. Maybe it's the start of your journey back to the Lord. Or maybe it's the very, very first step. I don't know squat. I don't know what it's like to be in the presence of God. But July 28, 2020, I'm taking my first step back or towards him for the very first time. There's a lot of garbage going on out there, but there's one awesome Savior and one awesome Lord who is Jesus Christ. And we praise him, and he's worthy of it. Thank you, Pastor.